Hi, I'm Rick Reimer with the Oklahoma Soybean Board, and I'm going to read a book to students today as part of the Read an Authentic Ag Book to Students program. Since our access to schools is a little bit limited, we're going to be reading and recording this book, and we're in the middle of a soybean field. And that's fitting because the book I want to read today is called Full of Beans, Henry Ford Grows a Car. It's by Peggy Thomas. And we'll talk a little bit about soybeans when we finish our book. Full of Beans. Henry Ford made cars, millions of cars. But this story isn't about cars. Well, maybe just one. It's about one car and a lot of beans. Henry had a mind for machines and was driven to improve the world around him. When he was young, his mother said, do something useful, and encouraged him to make a life for others a little smoother, a little easier, and a little happier. Sometimes he was successful. He built a smoother ride in his affordable Model T, sort of. He sped up factories with the moving assembly line and made the workers happier with a $5 a day wage. Sometimes he was not as successful. When he experimented with shrink-proof wool, all he got was a drawer full of tiny socks. One concern needled him his whole life, farming. Farming was hard work. No one knew that better than Henry. Growing up on a Michigan farm, he dreaded the long hours behind a horse and plow. From the time I left that front gate as a boy, my only interest in a farm has been to lighten its labors. If I can do that, I shall have rendered a real service to humanity. As a teenager, he hammered together a crude tractor, but it couldn't pull a hayseed. As a successful car manufacturer, Henry still experimented with building tractors from leftover car parts. One of these tractors, the Fordson, sold for more than 50 years. But heavy hauling and long hours of plowing was only part of the problem farmers faced. In 1929, the entire country suffered in the Great Depression. The stock market crashed, businesses failed, people couldn't find jobs, some farmers lost their land, others left crops rotting in the field because they couldn't afford to harvest. Henry remembered his mother's words, do something useful. What if farmers had a new market for their produce? They could earn more money and their crops wouldn't go to waste. Henry absolutely hated waste. Industry owes it to society to conserve material in every possible way. Henry recycled everything. The Ford factory in Dearborn, Michigan reused rags, boxes, and even sawdust. Every day, garbage trucks dumped seven tons of trash at the factory where it was processed and turned into useful products. Fuel for cars, material to pave roads, fertilizer for plants, charcoal briquettes for grilling hot dogs. What if we used farmer's crops the same way? Anything that can be grown for industry's raw materials will bring new revenue to agriculture. But first, Henry had to figure out which vegetables were suitable. On a patch of land that he called Greenfield Village, Henry built a laboratory. He hired a team of young men to study the chemicals in every grain and fruit and vegetable. One of those men was Robert Boyer. While ratchets and widgets cranked and spun in Henry's brain, Robert thought about chemicals and atoms that could be pulled apart and mixed together. Soon truckloads of vegetables tumbled in a heap outside the lab. Carrots one week, cornstalks the next, turnips, tomatoes, and wheat. Robert ground, whirled, boiled, and stirred. Henry rocked or did chin-ups on a beam. That was his way of thinking. After two years, they discovered the perfect crop for the factory. The soybean. People in China had grown and eaten soybeans for centuries, but in the United States, the soybean was cow feed. To Henry, it was a wonder crop. Soybeans were easy to grow. They enriched the soil and were bursting with oil and protein. Henry imagined farmers all across the country growing soybeans for food and industry. 
but exactly what could they make from the oil and the protein of the little legume. To work that out, Henry needed lots and lots of soybeans. In the spring of 1932, a fleet of Ford tractors planted 300 different kinds of soybeans across 8,000 acres. Soon the city of Dearborn was in a sea of soybeans. In the fall, Robert ground, whirled, boiled, and stirred. Henry continued to think. Mixing soybean oil with coloring and other ingredients created a paint that was glossier, less expensive, and dried to a harder finish than other coatings did. From a hospital bed where he was recovering from surgery, Henry announced that every Ford car would wear soybean paint. That came as a surprise to Robert, who had to hurry to perfect paint for production. Next, Henry's team mixed soy protein with a chemical resin to make hard plastic. Soon cars rolled off the assembly line gleaming with soybean plastic horn buttons, gear shift knobs, light switches, and distributor caps. The more cars Henry built, the more soybeans he needed. Henry kept a network of 700 Michigan farmers busy growing more than 22,000 acres of soybeans. Some people thought Henry was full of beans, and he was. He ate beans. One of his favorite snacks was the Model T. It was a soybean cracker cut from the dough using a real Model T hubcap. Henry sold soy flour to factory workers and served soy ice cream in the lunchroom. And he wore beans. Robert spun soy protein into thread. Woven into fabric, it was nearly as strong as wool. Henry's tailor stitched him a soybean suit, and the men from the lab gave him a soybean silk tie. And Henry wanted to drive beans. Every Ford car already contained a bushel of soybeans, from the gear shift knob to the paint, but Henry wanted the cars even beanier. He imagined an automobile as revolutionary as his Model T. A whole car made out of soybean plastic, so lightweight it would use less gas than any other car on the road. Making small plastic parts was easy. Molding giant plastic panels was not. When the first panel popped out of the mold, Henry grabbed his ax. Aiming the blunt end he swung. Crack! He punched a hole clear through. But to test the strength of the next panel, Henry jumped up and down on it. If that was steel, he said, it would have caved in. Henry attached a plastic trunk lid to his own car. With a crowd of people watching, Henry opened the trunk and pulled out his ax. He swung as hard as his wiry frame would allow. This time, the ax bounced off the plastic and over his shoulder. It was time to assemble the car. Henry's team affixed the plastic panels made from soybeans onto a tubular steel frame. Two fenders in the front, two in the rear, a front grille, the engine hood, the doors, and a roof. Fourteen plastic panels in all. No one had seen anything like it. The men from the Ford plant called it a monstrosity, just an old man's hobby. Henry knew it was much more. It wasn't just a car. It was the perfect symbol for how farms could fuel factories. On August 13, 1941, everyone gathered for the Dearborn Day festivities. Dressed in his soybean suit, Henry rode to the fairgrounds in his sleek new automobile the color of a wax soybean. Some folks joked that the car ran on salad dressing rather than gas. Others saw Henry's revolutionary vision. Please hurry, it, one reporter wrote. Mr. Ford, hurry, hurry. But four months later, no one was talking about Henry's amazing soybean plastic car. On December 7, the Japanese Navy attacked Pearl Harbor and the America was at war. The Ford Motor Company stopped making cars and began building bomber planes. 
the soybean plastic car rolled into storage. Nobody knows for sure, but its steel frame may have been recycled for the war effort. The plastic panels disappeared. It would have been one of Harry's last innovations. He died on April 7, 1947. Henry will always be remembered for making cars, millions of cars, but only one proved that Henry was not full of beans. Today, soybean farmers continue to fuel factories, growing furniture and flooring, dog biscuits and bread and candy and crayons and cars. Henry Ford was famous for founding the Ford Motor Company and building the Model T, which changed America from a horse and buggy country to a nation of paved roads. He sped up production by improving the assembly line and increased workers' pay. Yet most people don't realize that Henry's work with soybeans had just as much impact on American society as his work with cars. Time Magazine called him a bean's best friend and number one U.S. soybean man for his influence on agriculture and the industry. When Henry started experimenting in 1929, there was only three million acres of soybeans grown in the United States. His research increased demand dramatically and today, American farmers plant more than 84 million acres, making it the country's second most grown crop. Corn is first. His work with soybeans was part of a new science called Comergy, the study of chemicals inside everyday materials and how they can be used as the building blocks for products. The fuel of the future, Henry said, is going to come from fruit, like that stomach out of the road, or from apples, weeds, sawdust, almost anything. His plastic car would have been the perfect showcase for what Comergy could do if it hadn't been for World War II. Although the war stopped the car project, it helped develop soy foods. Scientists were looking for alternatives to meat and dairy which were rationed and Henry's soybean team created non-dairy whip topping from the oil and meat substitute from the protein. And while making soy fiber, Boyer tasted the material to see if it was ready and that's when he realized he could mold and favor the fiber. His first products were created in his basement lab. The average American today eats about half a cup of soybean products every day. So if you've ridden down any stretch of country highway, chances are you've seen a field of soybeans, just like the field behind me. It's a summer legume crop. Autumn, the fields turn bright yellow. One soybean plant grows 60 to 80 little pods that we'll look at in just a minute, and three to four beans each. They were originally grown in East Asia and arrived in the United States in 1765. Today, the soybean grows in almost any climate, and like any other legume, it works in partnership with beneficial bacteria to add nitrogen, a vital nutrient to the soil. Here's just a few of the products that contain soybeans. Margarine, glue, carpeting, biodiesel fuel, sunscreen, cooking oil, car wax, cosmetics, rubber, cleaning products, baked goods, crayons, paint, cereal, engine oil, mayonnaise, candles, medicine, soap, tabletops, building materials, ink, cheese, furniture, and foam, just to name a few. Well, we've been in a soybean field reading a book about Henry Ford called Full of Beans. Well, what kind of beans was he full of and did he do experiments with? It was actually soybeans. And this is what the finished product looks like after it's harvested in the field. But how does it get to that point? Well, the soybean seed is planted in the ground and it starts to germinate and send down a little root system and then starts a plant coming above the ground. In just a few short weeks, that plant looks like this. The root system underground, this is all above the ground. And late in the summer, in August in many cases, the plant will start to put blooms or little flowers up and down the stem and each place there's a flower it eventually turns into a little velvet pod in which the soybeans begin to grow it starts at the bottom of the plant and works its way up to the top these pods here are a little bigger but still flat with little tiny start 
of the soybean inside of them. In a month or two, in the fall, the, the pods are filled, the leaves fall off, and this is what the plant looks like when the farmer gets ready to harvest the soybean plant. He runs a harvesting equipment, and you can see little soybeans still in one of the pods here, and each of these pods has soybeans inside. The farmer runs his harvesting machine through the field, cuts the plant, works its way through the machine, and you end up with a bin full of soybeans once again. And from here, they go back to seed. A little bit of them go back for seed, and the rest of them all go to a processor where they're crushed and separate the meal from the oil and make all kinds of products, many of which we talked about in the book Full of Beans featuring Henry Ford. Soybean is food. Many soybean products are eaten by people, such as tofu and edamame, and the soybean meal is used in many products as well as the oil for human consumption. Soybean meal is a major ingredient in livestock feed for chickens and for hogs and for cattle and dairy cattle as well. The oil can be converted to biodiesel and so it becomes fuel for the trucks that run up and down the road in our country. And as we talked about in the book, the protein can also be spun into a fiber which is then used to make fabric and clothe many of our people. We call soybeans the miracle crop of many uses. Thank you for being here today as part of our Read an Authentic Ag book to students. We hope you've enjoyed the story called Full of Beans, the story of Henry Ford and his experimentation with soybeans and making the many products from them. Thank you.